This podcast is sponsored by Nobody. Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror sci-fi show where things could get totally radical. Now today, I will be welcoming Frank Jasper. All you 80s kids remember him. He is Matthew Modine's deadly opponent shoot in the 1985 cult classic Vision Quest. He wrestles Matthew Modine at the end of the movie. You hear his name throughout the whole movie. Shoot this, shoot that. And uh, he's coming on the show today. We're going to be talking about the making of that movie. Talk about his bodybuilding and his own wrestling days. And um, he also um, is a health expert. um, And he works in the healthcare field. And he also has a line of shoot shirts, which you can find on www.com shootshirts.com and it's going to be a great conversation today i cannot wait i I wrestled in high school and you know we watched vision quest on at the um at the uh you know end of the year rap party for the team and it's 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 like you know my life flashing before my eyes here um it's going to be a great conversation so uh yeah here is my interview with frank jasper Hey, Frank, welcome to the show, sir. How are you today? I'm doing good. Uh, I was worried because I have a robo killer analyzing these calls, and I try to pick up before it kind of hooks you up in the, up in the mother's land and kind of locks you in a box. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that whole meta thing has uh, become very popular now. Uh, this is such a great honor. Thank you for taking the time today. Oh, it's my pleasure. So, going back in time, uh, did you gravitate toward wrestling and bodybuilding and all that in your childhood? Yeah, you know, I read the autobiography of uh, the bodybuilder by uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger when I was in high school, and, and I was highly motivated. wanted to be in California bodybuilding, you know, the whole thing on the beach with these guys, getting yeah. big, having a great time, living the life, being in the side, all of that. Yeah, all that uh, Joe Weider stuff. <laughs> yeah, but it was it was more about his mentality, more about Arnold's mentality, about that he just set his mind. He did things different than most people. He really used his mind to help his body even perform at another level. And for me, that's just the difference that kind of set him aside, made him such a great um, bodybuilder, uh, entrepreneur, actor. You know, I mean, wherever he takes his talent, you know he's going to perform at the highest levels. Uh, absolutely. I mean, he's, he's, a, he's a dynamic um, uh, person, you know. Did you uh, play a lot of sports growing up? Yeah, I basically love to do just about everything. Our our, our family was big into water sports, uh, water skiing, snow skiing. Um, mm-hmm. I played basketball. I picked up tennis along the way. Um, I did a lot of martial arts. I love karate. I love you know the, the the discipline and the focus, and you know really training the body to the next level. I was big into all of the. Shogun miniseries. I just love the whole Japanese culture. There, that they were not just about battles, but there was a whole other level of spirituality with, with Bushi, being a Bushido. And if you're going to be a martial artist in, in the Asian countries, then you also need to know how to heal. So if you can, you can hurt, then you can heal. And you, especially if you're in martial arts, you also need to know how to take care of yourself when you get injured. So those kind of align themselves for me, both the, the martial arts and the healing. Um, as it kind of went down the road, I became an acupuncturist. Nice, nice. When you were um, doing uh, martial arts, uh, were you watching all the Bruce Lee movies? Well, Bruce Lee was huge, absolutely. Uh, Chuck Norris was doing some movies. 
Uh, some of the other other ones like Billy Jack, and all those movies were around that yeah. time. Um, uh, I, I always watch Kung Fu uh, because they also had the you know the spiritual aspect, the meditative aspect, the energy aspect involved as well. Wow, did you um, wrestle all four years in high school? Well, I actually only wrestled three years in high school, mm-hmm. and then the last year I decided not to wrestle, and I uh, started going with the uh, college tennis team, North Idaho college tennis team, through winter time because there's no there's no clubs in Coeur d'Alene where I was going to school. I grew up in the Pacific Northwest, and my last you know, high school years were basically there in Coeur d'Alene, graduated from Coeur d'Alene High. And there's a college, a local college called North Idaho College, and they had a tennis team. And they would go over to Spokane because that's where they had indoor, you know, clubs that you could practice all winter long. And so I spent my winter, instead of wrestling my senior year, playing tennis. And then I played my senior year, um, and then I got a scholarship to North Idaho College. Yeah, I, I I only wrestled my sophomore year in high school and a little bit of my junior year, and then I ended up having a health scare that ended up being nothing. And at the time, I had, I had very little appreciation for what I was doing, but as I look back now, you know, wrestling was really great um, for uh, discipline and just you know just for the just for the fun of, of of being involved in a very tough sport you know I look back on it with a lot of fondness and I, I push whatever I was feeling you know at the time aside well I, I have to agree I think it's one of the the toughest sports I've ever participated in and uh I've got a black belt in Aikido. I've been in six years, so I know how you know how what it, what it takes to become a black belt. You know, we were training six days a week um, the last six months, and it just it is uh, it's a dynamic challenge to go from two days a week where you feel like you're making some progress slowly to doing something five six days a week, and it just becomes like breathing. Yeah, um, and it just takes you to you know to that you don't even think about things. Well, um, wrestling was actually much more difficult uh, for me than even uh, black belt training. Mm-hmm. And I loved them both, by the way. I loved the I loved the physicality of both. I loved the kind of chess match, kind of you know counter re- you know reaction, counter that mm-hmm. attack, reattack. You know all of that. It's you know it's. Some of the best wrestlers are some of the smartest people I've ever met and hung out with. Yeah. Are you into the uh, whole UFC thing? You know, I, I, I watch it from time to time. I don't really follow it. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just uh, I'll see some of those highlights on my Facebook pages and, and reels and things like that. And it's just fun for me to kind of get... I just don't spend a lot of time in front of the TV watching... Uh, fights necessarily but uh i know i know some of the best fighters that ever were uh, i think and and some of them are my friends now but i used to love watching ken shamrock back in the day Mm -hmm. um uh, another uh, you know dan severin i actually am a friend with now and went on his podcast with another guy named don so dan and don uh both of these guys are some of the most profound UFC fighters in history, um, just amazing. <laughs> and boy, what a tough sport! You know, these guys really take a beating. Their bodies are taking a beating. As a matter of fact, uh, Dan and I have been talking about stem cell therapy, and, and he went down to Medellin, Colombia, and got a full body stem cell treatment. And I went to New Jersey um, and got it uh, with the pain management place there. Mm-hmm. New Jersey, which is a phenomenal place here in the United States to get stem cell therapy. I've had several injections in my knee and knees, I should say, and they've helped tremendously. I'm getting back to playing tennis two or three hours a day without having to tape and without having to recover, without having pain. Mm-hmm. And it's, to me, the new wave of treatment is really called regenerative medicine. Right. So, um, 
explore that. If you're out there and you're struggling with shoulder injuries, neck injuries, low back injuries, disc injuries, um, I just highly recommend looking into some of these alternative treatments other than just going under the knife and getting, you know, having surgery done. Yeah. Surgery has become uh, very overrated. <laughs> so you, you would... Atta- it's like, but it, it should be your very last choice. Mm-hmm. Look at everything you can possibly do, and when nothing else works, and you, you're not having quality of life, and this might offer you better quality of life, then go for it, most certainly. Right. So you attended um, Eastern Washington University. You were on the trajectory of practicing medicine, right? Yeah, I was actually, uh, I signed in and was uh, in the athletic training program, which was a, really a pre-med course because you're going to apply the, you know, PT schools, um, and it, get, it looked very good on your, your record. It's very competitive to get into those, and it's, uh, very challenging academics because you're you're studying as a pre med student mm-hmm. and you're also putting in over four thousand hours in the athletic training room during your during your time and uh, while you're there. Um, and I was also on top of that. I was bodybuilding uh, three days on, one day off, three days on, one day off for the last you know previous two three years or uh, five years altogether before I actually got the role in Vision Quest. Yeah, how how did you get the the role in Vision Quest? <laughs> well, I was the athletic trainer for I got into the program, and then they assign you certain teams, certain semesters. Uh, so you you usually work with each team, like basketball, football. And I just happened to be working with the wrestling team. I was the wrestling team's uh, athletic trainer during that time, mm-hmm. and one of the guys that was. Wrestling for Eastern Washington actually was an extra in the movie. His name is Rick Depot. Mm-hmm. He uh, took that semester off from Eastern Washington because he, he was working in the film as a uh, you know, somebody in the background. And he came in just to kind of watch the guys roll around. And we were sitting there, and I was reading my my medical books mm-hmm. on anatomy and physiology, trying to prepare, and just uh, – chatting with Rick on the, on the bench there on the side, and he was talking about a film that he was, you know, he was in this film, and they're actually paying him to wrestle, and it's, you know, it's fantastic, and they really treat you well, and then he says, you know what, they're still looking for somebody. They're looking for somebody about six foot tall, blonde hair, muscular build, that can wrestle, and he goes, hey, that's you. And I'm, no, I can't, I've never acted, I've never done anything like that. He goes, no, no, no you got to go talk to this lady. She's really nice. The casting director on the local area, uh, casting director, is really nice. you got to talk to her. So he gives me her number. And he finally convinced me. And I thought, well, listen, listen, you know, I'm paying for my education at this time. My parents had helped me a great deal, but I was in the process of paying for this, this education in eastern Washington. And part of how I was doing that was that on the weekends, I was working at the Balancer, that place called the Slab Inn. Mm-hmm. So the country western bar where, where there's usually about four or five fights a night. <laughs> I was only making about twenty five, thirty bucks, and I was like, "Okay, I think I can, I can do better." As just you know, maybe if somebody in the background in, in this movie, you know, I I'll get paid to be a wrestler, and they just need somebody that can, you know, fill in that position of being muscular that can wrestle. Well, I'll go give it a shot. Well. The uh, next day, I finally got an appointment in to see her and walked in, and she hands me sides, which are, you know, the equivalent of here's here's some, you know, verbiage or here's some dialogue that I want you to work with, and then we're going to go through this. And I didn't know that my character had any kind of lines. I just thought I was going to be a wrestler. Otherwise, I probably wouldn't have gone in. But I did go in, and I had... Um, I'm starting to read with her, and, and I made a mistake, and she, I kind of laughed because I was nervous, and she stopped me, and she looked at me, and she said, we're looking for intensity here. If you make a mistake, you just continue on as if nothing happened. Got it? And I was like, wow, okay, got it. <laughs> so I read the lines with her again, got through them. Great. She picks up the phone, calls the director, goes, okay, Harold wants to see you. 
Now, we're two and a half weeks out from the beginning of Vision Quest being filmed. Mm-hmm. They've cast this role two times before. Neither one of those guys worked out. I don't know why. They just didn't work out. Um, they're in countdown mode. They had this multi-million dollar film. They had no one to play the, the chief antagonist, which, as you can see in the movie, was kind of important. Yeah. <laughs> and it was countdown time. And so... I was pushed through about five different auditions. One of them I had to go wrestle for Cash Stone. He was the coach that was running all the wrestlers and, and certified everybody as, as being able to wrestle, uh, how well they could, where they could be put in the movie, etc. And then finally I, um, they said, okay, we're going to have the, the producers are flying up from, from California they, they're bringing this guy that they found in L.A. that they like. Now, the director likes you, and so you've got to convince those producers that you're the guy, not the one that they like that they're bringing there from Los Angeles. Yeah. Wow, okay. So, we, I, I go to this, this audition. The, the producers have flown in. I show up at the hotel. This is where they had their offices. I walk down the hallway with the casting director, and Harold Becker steps out of his room, out of his office, comes to meet me in the, in the, in the hallway there. And he says, okay, when you come in here, I want you to be intense the whole time you're in here, no matter what happens. You got it? And he goes, ah, smacks me on the side, and he'll slap me on the side of the face. <laughs> and I turn, and my teeth gritted, and I said, got it. He goes, that's what we're looking for. <laughs> <laughs> Mm-hmm. And I dropped 25 pounds, two and a half weeks, 
and we shot for 10 weeks, and I was at 4% body fat, and I actually weighed 189 pounds, not 169, or is that what it was, 169 pounds, that's the weight class, or 168? Yeah. Yeah, that's that's the life of an actor. <laughs> yeah, they 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 make their living uh, going through the hoops like that. Uh, yeah, Harold Becker and Daryl Ponixon, they were coming off of the Onion Field and Taps, so they were of, of a very great uh, combination when it came to uh, drama. Uh, were were you were you a fan of uh, their movies? Absolutely. And do you remember who was in Taps? Because that was another movie that he did. As uh, Tim- Timothy Hutton, Tom Cruise, Sean Penn, yep. George C. Scott, yeah. Yep. Yeah, Ronnie Cox was in that one as well. Billy Van Zant, who I've interviewed, he's also in that, yeah. And so you look at the people that he found, he, he had an eye for detail, which to me was his greatest gift was that his eye for detail, and he could see talent. So he picked certain people. And I look at that movie, and I go, look at Sean Penn, Timothy Hutton, Tom Cruise, John Cox. I mean, all of those guys, what an amazing cast. He had, I think it was Tom Cruise's very first movie yeah. he had lines in a major role. And he actually made Tom Cruise do that role in that movie where he you know, got on that uh, machine gun and was firing live ammo and being a little crazy. Forced <laughs> into that because he said we needed the we needed somebody on this in this role and he picked Tom Cruise and Tom Cruise said, No, I'm just you know, on background he said, You're either fired or you're gonna do the role and so he had to step up and do the role. And I think it kinda launched his career. So when you look back, you have to look at his work and the you know, the onion field was really a great project as well. And, yeah. you know, he's just a consummate, uh, and he's so detail-oriented. I'll, I'll tell you one story. Mm-hmm. Now, my hair was shaved. You remember how tight it was on the side? And yep. Short, a little short on the top, and they would just kind of put a lot of, like, air stuff in it and kind of smash it around. And yeah. there would be times where I wouldn't be filming for maybe three, four days, and then I would come back out and we'd film the scene. So we always had to show up hair and makeup and then we could go out on the set after we got all our whatever gear or whatever we're wearing for the day um and so i came on the set after three or four days of being off 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 work um off the shoot and i got to hair and makeup and i had my you know dressing gear on it was they were shooting some scenes uh, around the mat, and so I was just sitting there stretching on the mat, and they were at the other end shooting the scene, and, and all of a sudden it broke, and they were changing the lighting, and Harold, Bach, the Harold Becker walks over, and I'm just sitting there stretching, and he, he starts looking, watching what they're doing, at the same time he says, hey, how you doing? I said, good. He goes, have you been to uh, your makeup yet? He go, I said, oh yeah, I have. He said, did they cut your hair? I said, no, they didn't touch my hair. He goes, Go back and have him cut your hair. <laughs> How much do you think it has grown in the last three or four days? <laughs> he knew mm-hmm. that, that it still needed to be trimmed. I don't know if it was an eighth of an inch or a bit. It needed to be trimmed again to get you know, a match that I had, had done previously. But three, four days? Are you kidding me? That's the kind of eye for detail that he had on a daily basis and why I think he was one of the greatest directors of our time. Yeah, he was amazing. He directed a movie a couple of years after this uh, about uh, it, was, it was a very underrated movie about cocaine. It was called The Boost uh, with James Woods, and I, I think that was his best film. But um, Vision Quest definitely uh, ranks up there with Taps and Onion Field. I'll have to check that out. I didn't. I didn't. I don't think I've seen that. So I'll yeah, definitely going to watch that as well. Yeah, whenever whenever I bring that movie up to people, they they never heard of it. It, it it's probably the most dead on accurate uh, portrayal of cocaine use in the uh, the world of, of of success in L.A. It's 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 a very hard hitting movie, but it's great. What did you think you of the? Absolutely see James Wood in that role. Yeah, <laughs> he's great in it. Oh, he's he's really great in it. Him and uh, Sean Young. Um, what, what did you think of the Vision Quest script? Um, I, you know, listen, I was just a kid out of college. I'm just following 
doing what they asked me to do. It's like, mm-hmm. go up, you know, drop the weight, show up, do your lines, and that's, that's you know, that was my intention, that I was going to just be the best uh, shoot I could possibly be. I said, I said, that's all I can do is that I made a commitment to do this movie. I dropped the 25 pounds, two and a half weeks. I went from bodybuilding, which I was absolutely trying to pack on as much weight as possible. Mm-hmm. I would eat at the, um, you know, the, the lunch commons and, uh, at, at Eastern East Washington University where you could go and sit and they would, they had unlimited amount of food you could eat. So you could go back as many times as you want. So I absolutely abused that. I would eat five platefuls of food every meal because <laughs> I had this mentality that I had to put in that, that amount of calories to kind of get, actually pack the weight on. So I went from five platefuls of food for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, down to eating two meals a day, egg whites for breakfast, a salad, a can of tuna, a squeeze of lemon for lunch, mm-hmm. and then for dinner I got on a, a stationary bike and rode for an hour. Nice. Wow. So I was just locked into that. I wasn't there to evaluate, you know, whether it was a good, good um, project or not. I just showed up to do the best possible job I could do, and I had to leave everything else to other people. That introduction scene where you're carrying the log up the bleachers, was that real? Were you really that guy who could do that? Well, (laughs) I was a bodybuilder. I was... I was doing front squats with 315 pounds and, and, and had a, you know, I would stand on a two by four on its laid on side yeah. flat and front squats with 315 pounds for 20 reps easily. That was just part of my leg work, workout. That was just like the warm up, the front squats. So carrying a log on my back up the state, you know, stadium stairs was really nothing at that time. Um, I reenacted that role about five, six years ago, and the log that I had in Vision Quest was lightened up somehow. I don't know, it wasn't quite as heavy as a real log would be at that size. Then some years ago, I, I, they sent out a, a real log to the um, Los Angeles uh, fundraiser that we were doing out of North Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. And I uh, carried that up onto the stage and we auctioned it off, and Randy Couture, um, won that auction, and you know all that money was donated to you know United States or U.S. Uh, Wrestling Foundation. So I found out that I could do it even in my early 60s, carry a log. So um, you know, doing that at that time would have not been a problem at all. If it had been even a, a semi-real log, it would have been easy because I was just young and you know in my bodybuilding. You know, I was just dedicated to that as well. That's amazing. Did, how, how long did it take to um, do the final match at the end? Well, um, it took an entire week. We shot, and there was over 1,500 extras that they bust in from, like, Fort Lane. Some of my, some people that I knew when I was growing up were there. Mm-hmm. So people from Coeur Lane were there. Uh, people from Spokane were there. Over 1,500 extras. We shot for 18, 16 to 18 hours Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday of that week, and then just about 8 to 10 hours on Thursday and Friday just to shoot, you know, that final wrestling match. Mm-hmm. Did you get a lot of good with Matthew Modine? You know, it's funny. It was, uh, I really didn't get a chance to talk to him during the filming. Because he was he was in basically every shot of that film, um, and I was only there for my scenes. And then when I was there, you know, the people that had lines, they had what they called, you know, these these stars, these little star cabins. Yeah. And so we would just be in our cabin waiting to be called out on the set. And the only reason I'd be there if I had a scene to do, and I would go show up, get my lines. You know, find out what I'm supposed to do, get the get the blocking right, and then we go. And I don't know if it was design by design, but I think it might have been to some degree that Harold kind of kept us apart, so that the animosity or the you know the kind of realness between.
between us would be uh, would come out in the match. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, one thing I noticed, John. I, I do want to tell you that uh, I did meet him years later and hung out with him. Super nice guy. Yeah. Really good person. His wife used to be married to the same woman um, that he was married to when he was doing Vision Quest all the years of his career. He's, he's done over 60 movies and he's still, he's still out there hitting it hard. I mean, he just uh, finished with Danger Things, which is a crazy box. You know, it's being watched by just about everybody. So uh, he's still out there doing a very good job. Oh, yeah. Wasn't he a uh, Screen Actors Guild president for a bit? I have no idea. I know he was running, so I didn't even know if he actually got that role. He used Vision Quest uh, as part of his advertisement. He said, even shoot one, Matthew Modine to be a <laughs> SAG president. I thought that was pretty funny. Yeah, I thought that was pretty cool at the same time. Uh, yeah, one thing I noticed, uh, John Peters, he's obsessed with the name Loudon because not only is that Matthew Modine's character's name in Vision Quest, it's also Griffin Dunn's name in Who's That Girl, the Madonna movie that he did a few years later. I always thought that was that was that was kind of weird. I haven't heard that name anywhere else. Mm -hmm. Well, I, what I think it's just amazing is that um, I'm still active in the wrestling community. I'm really a really wanting to continue to support wrestling. It's a it's a fantastic sport. Mm -hmm. It's probably the best sport besides and along with um, gymnastics that will give you that kinesthetic awareness of meeting your body in space and time. Um, it's probably the best sport for that. And it is a way to really learn about your where your weaknesses are, where your fears are. Um, challenge you in many ways because you're never going to win every match you're always going to have some where you're going to lose and for some reason you're going to then have, how do you handle that and so you really are learning to how to handle um, challenges in your life and then how to get up from losses and how to move forward um, and then make better choices going forward so for me it's just life lessons that are learned through the sport but it, it, it's, it's also one of those sports that I think is, if you haven't wrestled, you don't, you don't, you may not understand all the little intricacies, and so it might not be very interesting. So well, I'm doing my best to try and promote wrestling in, in the places where people don't know much about it and kind of be a, a spokesperson for how great of a uh, sport it is. Also, my greatest uh, focus or my, my what I want to leave the wrestling community with, you know, as, as a participant and somebody who's watched the it, it evolve, is that I want to work through this whole concept of cutting weight. You know, it's not a cutting sport, it's a wrestling sport. We always, you know, say that. But still, we have really bad habits that continue out there, which is like starving, dehydrating, overtraining, and then expect these kids to perform at high levels at tournament levels. In a tournament competitions, you just can't. And so we need to be, as a sport, on the cutting edge of the nutrition and be utilizing this. Because the last thing you want to do is, is create eating disorders, um, a hormonal dis problem, kidney issues, and, and psychological um, challenges because you've gone through this cutting weight and yo yoing and disrupting your endocrine system because you're starving it, especially at the time when these kids are in the beginning of their growth cycles when their hormones are kicking in, the last time you want to starve and, and prevent them from maybe hitting their growth spurt on time or uh, producing hormones that get them to the next level, we need to be on top of that. And I'm working on it. So I, I've done podcasts. I'm talking about nutrition. I've worked with top-level athletes, we can talk about that later, I'll tell you who I'm working with, and I've really flipped this whole concept of being uh, carb-loading for wrestling to being more of a fat-adapted, more of a keto athlete, and we can talk about more in depth about what that means, but anyway, I just want to share that with you. Yeah, oh yeah, I'm definitely going to ask uh, about that stuff. Um, I, I, was I was curious, do you, do you remember anything about Charles Hallahan or Linda Ferentino? 
Absolutely. Charles Hallahan is a consummate actor. He was one of those character actors that, you know, he just he kind of flowed into whatever role. He took on a, a, a coach's role in a sport he's never ever even probably seen or watched. Mm-hmm. And I absolutely believe he, he, he was kind of reflected in that very well. He stepped into that role, took it on. He had just recently had a heart bypass. Um, uh-huh. surgery done. He had a, a, a vein pulled out of his leg and placed in his heart and yet he was able to perform and do everything he needed and he had probably the best stories because he'd been around he'd seen pretty much everything but he was just a, a very funny guy very um, you know interesting and, and like I said he, I just totally believed him in his role um, Linda Valentino absolutely very much like Carla. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, sexy, you know, uh, little, you know, um, tough, feisty, all of that. So, and another person who's, who came right out of acting school, that was her first role, was Vision Quest. Mm-hmm. Yeah, cast in Vision Quest right out of acting school. And still, absolutely nailed that role. Absolutely. I think she was terrific in it. Um, I went to I went to go see Journey in concert in 2014, and their opening song was "Only the Young," and everyone went crazy for it. Um, I, I think it's one of their best hit songs, and that whole album in general is just a, a great soundtrack album. I uh, the, the soundtrack is just phenomenal. It still inspires. It still gives me chills. Uh, as soon as I turn our bike here, I'm going to take friends. It's like I want to do jump ups right there on the spot or push ups or, you know, hip mm-hmm. pipes or something. You can't get away from that. I think Randy Couture actually used to come out to that as his fight song. Oh, yeah. um, back in the day when he was a UFC fighter. Uh, and, and so many other people as they were growing up, their coaches would play that in the, in the wrestling room. Uh, it's just great, great nostalgia. Yeah, it's it's awesome. Do do you think that WWF has really tainted the sport uh, of, of real wrestling? You know, WWF has thousands, if not millions, of fans, and they're entertainers. Yes, they are athletes and entertainers, and you can see how they can make that transition. But Dwayne, you know. Brock Johnson, you've got David Batista, who's killing it. You, you know, you, you've got um, a few other other athletes as well that have made that transition. And because I think they learn to be actors and to be performers mm-hmm. in the WWE, and and you have to be an athlete. You have to be able to be physically adept at flipping your body around 230, 150, 270 pound bodies through the air and landing and trying not to get hurt, but a lot of times these guys get beat up really uh, badly in that sport, and that's, that's the down part of that. You know, they we have very short life, you know, life cycle there, and I, that's why I think The Rock got out. I think that's why Dave Batista got out, and look at, look at how well they're doing. You know, it's just um, dominating the box office in certain areas and the fact that Dave Bautista is taking on certain roles that are not just about his strength or his you know size he's also a, a very good actor so mm-hmm. uh, WWE good for them yeah. <laughs> uh, what we need to do is find a way to make college wrestling more pal- palatable more entertaining uh, more understood by the general community. Uh, the, the hardcore wrestlers, they get it, right? They get it, and, mm-hmm. and it's it's like, again, one of the toughest sports I've ever been involved in. And I just got through working a, uh, working with a guy named Brad Swartz. Brad Swartz has been wrestling since high school. He's never stopped. And he's in his 60s, and now he's, he's won eight Masters championships. In total, 
Uh, he reached out to me before this last one and to work with me on nutrition. And we kind of dialed in a few things there about three, four weeks out. He came and I, I, I flew into Las Vegas to watch him wrestle. He won. That was some tough matches. And he got a really good pop. He had a big, you know, swell underneath his right eye where he took a headbutt. Mm-hmm. And, you know, who say, finished that match, came back around next day, finals, win that match. That's his, that was his seventh Masters Championship. Um, then 32 days, he turns around, flies over to Poland, and wrestles in the World Cup there. Beats a 13-time World Cup champion, Masters champion in the final. Takes him out of bounds, or takes him to his back, pins him in the first round. Wow. The guy is amazing. He is a top, he's a, probably the toughest man on the planet at this time. Yeah. <laughs> they gave him an award there uh, for three foot tall award for the best wrestler out of over 500 different wrestlers from age 25 past 60 and the 70s. And this guy was named uh, the, the best wrestler of that uh, World Cup championship. So you watch how, how much time these guys put in, how tough it is. I got on the mat with this guy just to do a demonstration. Mm-hmm. And man, he, he just you know, hammered me. And I came back, I had, you know, a title in my left eye, bruises on my face, just from just, you know, hand fighting and just being on the mat with them for like, two times. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I gotta say, I loved it. And just kudos to this guy who's traveling around the world and winning World Cup championships. Wow, that is awesome. After um, Vision Quest, uh, were you uh, pursuing acting? Because I noticed uh, you were in the Freeway Maniac. <laughs> yeah, you know, so what happened is, and so, so let's go back to the filming. So was, here's the crazy part, is that I thought I was done after we filmed for 10 weeks, and I finished, and I went right back to school, and I got to finish my degree, and, you know, excited about my athletic training and bodybuilding, had a bodybuilding contest, it was going to be in like eight, nine months, and prepping for that, and so back to school, three months later, I get a phone call. Mm-hmm. Hey, Frank, we got one more scene to do. And I said, you know, are you available? I said, well, of course I'm available, but just know that I'm weighing 217 pounds now. Oh, you got to start dropping weight. I go, oh, listen, guys, like, okay, so how much time do I have? I said, well, you got a month. Oh, like, okay. So I dropped from 217 down to 189, I fly to L.A., and we shoot the weight in scene. That, mm-hmm. for some reason, they, they missed something, they had to reshoot it, they didn't get what they wanted. Okay, so, given more lines, a little, little bit more things to do there. Shoot it, I go back to school, I'm back to bodybuilding three days on, one day off, back to five meals a day, uh, at the meal. <laughs> so <I play laughs> the food, you know, every meal, five plates, and I'm back to training hard. Three days on, one day off. Three months later, I get another call. Hey, Frank, we got one more scene to do. I'm like, oh, you guys can't be serious. I have to, I'm weighing 225 pounds. There's no way I'm going down to 189. I got a bodybuilding contest in like six, you know, like less than six months. Okay, let me talk to, let me talk to Harold. Oh, yeah, yeah, you come back and you go, like, listen, no worries. Um, but you got to lose some weight. And I was like, okay, I'll drop, to two, I'll drop down to 200 pounds. Because the scene that I was doing was the one that I was wearing uh, the jean jacket. It was the bathroom scene. Like, hey, you're a leader. You know, I like to see blood. That scene. So I drop the weight. I go down. Or I go fly to L.A., shoot the scene. I go back to school. Get ready for my bodybuilding contest. Now, the movie's gotten released. And I'm still going to school. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was released out premiered out in New York. I hadn't seen it yet. I get a call. Hey, Frank, uh, we saw your work in Vision Quest. We would like, like to represent you. Why don't you come to LA and talk to our agency and see if we can get you, you know, represented. So I think about this, and I, I just finished my major, meaning my athletic training degree. 
I had put in over 4,000 hours in the athletic training room. I was done with that. Mm-hmm. And I was well into finishing my minor, which is just K through 12 education. And I thought, okay, how often do you get an offer like this? Might as well give it a shot. I can always finish my degree another time. Right. So, yes. In answer to your question, I said, okay. So I flew down to L.A. My brother was living there, and um, I ended up interviewing with the, with the agency and ended up signing with somebody else. So I packed everything up in my 280ZX, and I knew how small it's a two-seater. Everything I owned fit in that 280ZX, and I drove to L.A., Slept on the floor of my brother's uh, room until I could find a, you know, a floor to pay for a um, one bedroom. Uh, actually, I, did, I split a one bedroom. He got the bedroom. I got the futon in the front room. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was uh, right next. It was like two blocks from the beach, so that was the big payoff. And so I went. I started going out on auditions. I immersed myself in acting. I didn't just kind of like think that I was going to be the big shot now in L.A. I went and I started acting classes, and it was from 6 to midnight, four nights a week. Monday, it was Tuesday, Monday through Thursday. I did that for a year, and then I changed and went to another acting class with John Sarno. And it was Monday through Friday, and we had started 6, and whatever we finished, we finished. And it was usually between 12 and 1 p.m., you know, 1 a.m. in the morning. Mm-hmm. And so for the next two years, I did that. And in the meantime, I got a, I got a, a national uh, commercial playing a, uh, I think it was a lifeguard. Mm-hmm. And that, I got a TV show. I did the, I did a little piece on a TV show, and I also did Highway Maniac, uh, which I do not recommend people watch. It's yeah. not really worth your time. Yeah. <laughs> 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 um, and I was also working at Universal Studios doing a live show um, for, I did it two and a half years it was a Conan show uh-huh. and I played a double swordsman in a live action Conan show up at Universal Studios mm-hmm. and that was a great gig because I was performing in front of crowds every day and then if I needed to go to an audition and it interfered or it kind of coincided with my schedule up there, I could find somebody else to replace me within the crew, and I could go do my audition, so it was really kind of a cool gig, man. Nice. I did that for three years. Yeah, for three years, and, and I, you know, as most actors do, they're, they're running on empty 99% of the time because, you know, we're doing acting class till midnight, 1 o'clock, I get up, I go um, do auditions, I get cleaned up, and I go to my job, you know, and... It's, it's a cycle, like hardly any sleep, hardly any, I was eating, uh, it was at Denny's, you know, the, the big meal at Denny's, that was my, you know, that was my main source of food, and I drank too much coffee, and it just totally destroyed my whole system, and so I had to kind of like reevaluate after two or three years, like, I don't feel good, and my body's breaking down, and so that's why I, I stopped acting and started going into healing again. Mm-hmm. And that's where I um, decided to become an acupuncturist. And I thought, this is, this is simple. I'll just take a few acting or a few uh, classes about where the needles go and I'll be an acupuncturist. Well, that's a, it was a five-year degree to get a master's degree in oriental medicine. Mm-hmm. Even with all my, you know, chemistry and Western sciences handled, because I had already done pre-meds, all the anatomy, physiology, Mm-hmm. Like all of that was already done, but yet it still took another five years to mm-hmm. get a master's degree. And then my wife and I opened a clinic, and for the last, you know, 27 years we had a clinic in Pacific Palisades, which we closed years ago during COVID, and moved to Carmel, where I'm at now. And uh, that has been kind of this big kind of shift because now I'm doing all my nutrition via the phone and I have patients in New York, Tennessee, uh, um, Colorado, Texas, California, or up and down in California, LA, and different places, but um, started working with 
specific athletes, and we can go into that more later. But I just want to kind of give, lay it out for you. That's kind of where I'm at with mm -hmm. uh, that process. Funniest thing ever, though, Vision Quest has come back around, and I've, I'm working with a producer. We've written a series, and we're packaging it, and we're just now trying to find a, the right showrunner and the director. Everything else is in place pretty much. And it's it's going to be a similar concept that we that we that yeah, they did for Cobra Kai. What are these characters doing thirty years later? Nice. It's going to be a little more gritty. It's going to be a more realistic. Uh, it's going to be a little bit more like a Friday Night Lights concept. Nice, I love it. That is so cool that you're going to um, do a uh, like a, a Cobra Kai of, of Vision Quest. Has that project been pending for a while? Listen, I've been on it for uh, a year and a half. Mm -hmm. So if you understand that, like everybody thinks that you could just like, hey, I'm just going to do this project and get made. Well, yeah, people that are deeply connected and and have done great work in the past will take sometimes 10 years to get a project off the ground. I mean, good projects. So I think we're ahead of the curve. I think we're really kind of moving toward just getting this made. We're not far off. Um, we're just waiting for these, you know, the two pieces that we have to kind of get, which is, a, a, a like I said, a showrunner and maybe a, a really known, well-known director. Oh, that's so awesome. I can't wait for that. So, so when did you start working in the holistic health care field? 93, I think, is when I graduated. I was seeing patients before that for about two years. Mm -hmm. I was doing private sessions with patients at home. And then I graduated. We, did, uh, we, we worked out of the house there for a while, and then we moved into our clinic on Sunset Boulevard in Pacific Palisades. So that was probably like 94 or 95 that we opened our clinic. And I just, I've been working with people for over almost 30 years now um, with health, fitness, nutrition, and longevity. Wow. So, like, what, 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 so, like, what, what, what do you think is a good health plan, like, as, as far as, you know, uh, being a person who goes through their daily life? Okay, well, listen, 85%, let's just start understanding that 85% of pretty much all health issues can be resolved by eating right, exercising properly, getting enough rest, hydrating, and dealing with stress levels in a healthy way, um, right. and having exercise and movement. You can bring in and incorporate those things, and 85% of all health issues are not going to be a problem, most likely. So we start with that concept. So when I when I, I do a specific, you know, I, when I when I work with anybody, mm -hmm. I'm designing it to what they're dealing with. Meaning everybody is as different outside as they are inside. So I can't say, oh, okay, Tommy, I'm going to have you take 10 cattle in a day and three, you know, Antronex and, you know, six Dranaman, and it's going to work the same for Bob over here. You know, it's going to have the same impact, the same thing. No, everybody has different needs. Their bodies process things different. Their microbiome will actually be uh, absorbed, break down, mm -hmm. and, and digest things different. And you might have a weakness in your adrenals. Bob may have problems with his, uh, his heart muscle or his kidneys or his, his microbiome might be off, dysregulated, or his sleep cycle might. So everybody has to, is going to come to me with different needs. And mm -hmm. so when I, when I do my testing, I'm testing for individual needs, and I go through sometimes I, everything they put in their mouth or drink during the day and test to make sure that that's going to work for them. It's going to feed them and help them get stronger, better. Do you know who Djokovic is? I've, heard, Djokovic? I've heard the name. Tennis player. One of the top tennis players in the world, and he just won another um, Wimbledon. He's mm. at 21 majors at this time. Rafael Nadal is at 22 majors. But I, I have a feeling that you know, Djokovic will pass him at some point here, and it might even be this year at the U.S. Open. Don't know. He'll, he'll at least he'll, he'll match him at least. 
Anyway, his story was Roger Federer, Rafael Nadal were one and two in the world for years, and he was number three for probably, I want to say, five years. Mm -hmm. And the nutritionist noticed something, said, you have sensitivity to a lot of the foods you're eating. And he removed all those foods that he was not just allergic to, but was sensitive to. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, he went on a, a tear. He won everything for 72 matches in a row without losing anything. And he became number one in the world, and then he became number one for several years after that. And nice. when he was asked, what was the difference? He said, it was diet. I just had to change my diet and then take out these foods that were clogging my system. Now that they perform at the top, top, you know, often levels, now I can. So that is very specific to Novak Djokovic. You see that at this elite level, one thing changes in your diet can make it the difference between you being number three in the world and being number one in the world. So what do you want to do as a wrestler? What do you want to do as a human being? Do you want to be dedicated to taking care of your body's needs, nutritional needs, you know, hydration needs, sleep needs, stress, you know, just being out in fresh air, being on the ground, all of those things are helpful. So, and then to have physical movement. So bringing all these in is the kind of the foundation of health. So that's where you start. And then you reach out to somebody like myself and we nail it down into specifics. Like you're gonna have like, oh, you wanna have almonds? Okay, you tested for three almonds today. That's it, that's all you get of that. Yeah. You wanna have blueberries? Yeah, you can have a quarter cup. That's enough of that. Okay, you, you tested for, you know, grass-fed beef? Okay, you can have that two, maybe three times a week max. So we muscle test everything for every person um, that they're going to be working with and, and dial it into that level and magic happens. I have patients that are, I don't say, hey, I'm gonna help you drop weight. I say, I'm gonna create a healthy lifestyle and whatever weight your body doesn't need, it will fall off. I have one woman that changed just like, here's what I want you to eat. Here's your nutrition. Mm -hmm. Dropped nine pounds in two weeks. And it was like she wasn't trying. She just was eating right. So that's the key. Nice, nice. So how did shoot shirts come about? <laughs> well, um, I was going along fine. I hadn't talked or been around the wrestling community for almost 20, 27 years, something like that. And a friend of mine named Scott Glass, who was a coach at Santa Ana High School for over 28 years and then retired just recently, um, he was a wrestler in the wrestling room at Eastern Washington, mm -hmm. reached out to me and said, hey, Frank, I've got this tournament, and I would love for you to come and give away uh, ribbons and trophies. And I'm like, yeah, sure, Scott, I'll come down there. It's great. People, people still think Vision Bus is cool? Yeah, okay. So I went to the tournament did that and I really made some nice connections with wrestlers and, and I, then somebody reached out and said hey we have World Cup coming to Los Angeles and we'd like to, uh, like you to promote it will you come to the to the gala event and I was like absolutely and I thought well listen if I'm going to go to one of these events you should have something to sell right mm -hmm. and so my wife Sanda and I uh, sat down with a, uh, a graphic artist and we took a certain snapshots from the movie and then changed them, you know, changed the contrast and did different things. And we came up with these two shirt concepts. And so we had them printed up and I started selling the shirts. Yeah. <laughs> and that's how it started. Do they sell out every day? You know, I get, I get, you know, I, I just keep stocking. I keep getting them printed up. And, and um, one thing that I did that I, that I think was really to do is that I didn't just get the cheapest shirt available. You know how they'll, they'll give you those, here's a free shirt at an event. And most of the time it's out of the, you know, maybe cotton or cotton blend. But you wear them once or twice, and then they never fit right. And you just kind of hang, and they look crappy, and they get wrinkled, and they don't feel good in your skin. Mm -hmm. I picked a, a, it's called a tri-blend. 
and these shirts really wear really exceptionally well, and you can you can wear them for years and years, and then they just wear out finally, and then the people throw them away. But it's just um, I, I just love when people post pictures, different pictures, like Richard Pato would post a picture of him, his shirt's completely all sweated out. He says, yep, when shoots in the house, things get real. And that just, that just pleases me to no end, I got to tell you. I'm just so happy that people are still finding inspiration in the character and the movie and, and wanting to be better wrestlers and better human beings for that. Yeah, I'll eventually get one. Uh, my weight is always um, dr- uh, is always dropping, and um, once I get to um, a certain weight, I'll uh, I'll definitely uh, get one. I just got diagnosed with diabetes back in April, so I'm on a specific diet. I've lost 20 pounds so far. There you go. There you go. Yeah, and ba- basically, they probably put you on a somewhat keto friendly diet. I would imagine. I mean, I, I could do keto. Yes, no? Yeah, I mean, I could do keto, but what I've been doing is just, you know, no sugar. Um, you know, I wake up every day, I eat an avocado, I go to the gym, and um, th- that's about it. I mean, I, I, I don't eat any sugar. I, don't, I try to stay low carb, but I eat lots of vegetables and, you know, drink lots of water, and it's working. is very similar. I take it to kind of like the next level, but it's very, very similar to what I do with, with these with these wrestlers. We mm-hmm. I help them go through what's called intermittent fasting, and yeah. that means that their body's going to be purged of the, you know, the glycogen in their system, meaning the sugar in their system. Mm-hmm. Now, when you say you avoid sugar, I get it, but you have to be even more, you know, even more precise. We need anything that will then break down into sugar as well. So that can be breads and pastas and cookies, cakes and candies and crackers. Yes, you can say avoid sugar, but look how many uh, places you'll find sugar. If you go and have a piece of bread, yeah. you look at the contents, a lot of times you'll see high fructose corn syrup in there. Yeah. That's sugar, my friend, and it's the worst kind of sugar. So look even more in depth into what you might be having. I love that you're going to get up and you're going to have an avocado and you're going to go work out. Mm-hmm. Now, you're doing almost an intermittent fast doing that, and that's the simple way to do that is from your meal at night, you wait 14 to 16 hours before you have your next meal. Mm-hmm. Now, you have um, the ability that if you wait and not have that avocado until you're at the end of that fasting, then you can either do one of two things. You can either then have an avocado and some other little, little things, maybe some eggs. I usually do two pieces of bacon and two eggs and, and a half an avocado. Right. Um, that is my go-to meal um, that is, you know, high pro, you know, it's, it's protein, high fat content, right? Right. So the bacon is really not protein, it's primarily fat. The avocado is primarily fat, and, you know, you've got some protein in the eggs, but there's some healthy fats mm-hmm. as well. So my concept is, is really low carb, um, medium amounts, of low protein, and higher fat content. That's exactly what the LA Lakers are doing. It's exactly uh, the LeBron James did before he left the Cleveland Cavaliers. He went so far as to not do any carbohydrates, no sugar whatsoever, and went from 270 to 250 and was able to run up and down the court for 40 minutes at a time carrying the Cleveland Cavaliers on his shoulders. That's a similar concept to what I, what I promote. And I do go in and out of ketosis. I don't stay in ketosis. I don't think that's a healthy long-term thing to do. I'm going to say that right now. Mm-hmm. I think David Asprey has it right on the nose where he stays in ketosis in the morning, and then midday he'll have some carbohydrates. So you kind of deplete it, then you fill it back. You deplete it, you put it back but just small amounts and, and good carbs. Um, and by the way, vegetables have a tremendous amount of carbohydrates in them. Mm-hmm. So you can get good carbs just from your vegetables. Um, right. And so remember that uh, there's another piece to this that you can get even a bigger advantage to what you're doing, and that is do your intermittent fast like I suggested. Right. Don't have that avocado. Go work out at the end of your fast. 
Now you don't have any carbohydrates, you don't have any glycogen in your system, it's depleted after approximately eight hours. You get to the end of your fast, which is closer to 14 hours, you train at that time, now your body only has the reserves of fat to use for energy. So now you're teaching your body how to use fat for energy, not just carbohydrates. As long as you've got carbohydrates coming into your system, your body's going to grab that for energy. And it's going to spike, and then you're going to crash. And then the byproducts from using your carbohydrates are toxic to the system. So those have to be detoxified through your body. And if you have extra, if you put in too many carbohydrates or too much sugar in your system trying to uh, carb load and or trying to recover your you know, your um, glycogen debt, now you're setting yourself up for an in, in, uh, injury. And yep. any excess will be stored as fat. And so, and it will cause inflammation in your system. And it feeds bacteria and viruses and parasites in your system. So yep. this is what we really want to be teaching our athletes to do, is to do carb loading before and then, you know, carb loading after. I don't think so. Yeah, I, I have no plans of eating sugar until my 40th birthday next June. <laughs> I, this was my first birthday uh, w without cake, and it, it actually turned out better than I thought it would be, you know? I mean, I'm a huge cake guy, but this year, it, it was very rewarding. It, it, it gave me a good reminder that, you know, it's better to be alive than to, you know, put that toxin in my body. Right, and so where it goes is, Oh, you're having lots of sugar in your system. Or you're carb loading like crazy and then trying to glyc you know, hit your glycogen to bed afterwards. You're throwing, or you're drinking also. Okay, so let's let's go back to another professional athlete. Um, there was a, a center out of out of New York that then got sent and drafted to to L.A. Mm -hmm. um, and that's back when Kobe was there. Yeah. And the center was about he's almost six foot tall, beautiful body, twenty in his twenties. He looks like uh, a god out there. He's got these big delts and his abs and his big chest and and no spit of fat on him. And yet he's just injured. He cannot play to the level he needs to play. His back is always hurting. Kobe says, "Listen, man, we all are injured. We all play. What happens? He doesn't do it. Doesn't make it. Uh, doesn't do what the LA team expects of him. They trade him." And then when they find out, when he gets traded, they find out that he's pre-diabetic at age, like, 25. Yeah. And here's this professional athlete, pre-diabetic, and he was consuming the equivalent of 32 Snickers bars a day. Wow. God. And when you do that, I remember I mentioned you set yourself up for injury. Yeah. It happens when you have excess sugar in your system. Those sugar, that sugar looks for receptor sites to lock onto. And the ones that it likes are um, protein receptor sites for your muscles. And so when it makes a, a lock onto that receptor site, it creates what we call a rigid bond. Now you get, keep getting rigid bonds in your muscles, and they're not going to expand and contract. And, and so they're going to have rigidity. You're going to lose your range of motion. You're going to lose your plyometric ability to do you know, explosive moves, and if you do, it's not going to stretch and snap back, it's going to tear. So now we have a guy who isn't going to be able to perform, and his body is inflamed, and he's sore, and he's got less range of motion. They put him on the same diet that they put everybody else on in L.A., basically. Um, and he's been brought back to L.A. as a center again. And he's performing much better. He's not injured all the time, et cetera, et cetera. That's how powerful too much sugar in your system. And that, that I don't care how good an athlete you are, you're going to destroy your system if that's if that's the way you're you know you're feeding your body. Yeah, it's not worth it at all. Um, do you have anything upcoming you'd like to mention? on that series and I'm right. also in the process of uh, working with a, another individual to you know bring a, a project to life so we're in the process of looking and reading scripts and I've got it down to two which he's now reading we're going to decide on one of those two and then we're going to get them uh, get one of those made 
So besides the um, series, I'm also working on uh, these other two projects. So I've got that. Mm. Um, I think that I mentioned, well, I, I haven't mentioned the guy's name, but I, for over a year and a half, I've been working with Nick Suriano. He came in almost two years ago to my office in Pacific Palisades, and we had a nice connection, and he asked to, uh, to, for me to work with him nutritionally. And so we moved him from a glycogenic based athlete, you know, it was carb loading, uh, to more of a ketogenic fat adapted athlete. And if you if you remember what he did, you know, he, he was twenty nineteen he was hundred and thirty three pound NCAA national champion. Mm-hmm. And he had to cut to get down to that. So now he's gonna wrestle at one twenty five and so that's even a bigger cut and a harder ask and to maintain his strength um speed and endurance that's the trick right right you're that kind of weight um and we were able to do that and he dominated at the nca or actually dominated the big tens first <laughs> nobody came close and then even in the final the little scrappy final of the nca the guy never scored one point they're all um, points that were awarded because of, uh, of like a jump start or they're, they called stalling, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But anyway, mm-hmm. um, he ends up winning again, NCAAs, at 125 pounds, and, he, and his coaches were so astonished that he could make that kind of a cut and still have that kind of energy, strength, and endurance. So I'm actually in talks with the Michigan coach, and to, to be their nutritionist, the whole team. And so we'll see how that goes. I've also spoken to um, the coach up at Stanford as well. And so I'm looking at possibly being their nutritional guy. I have that going on. I'm looking to reenact or uh, bring back a, a nutritional podcast. So I'm in talks with a guy named Richard Pato, who's got a, who's got a, a U.S. wrestling um, channel thing going now looking to see if I can bring nutritional awareness to the wrestling community. That's awesome. And also, too, are you are you going to write a memoir? <laughs> well, you know, I, I do better at promoting other people than I do promoting myself. Um, I, I think that the, the story of, of me getting that role in Big Red, I think it's a great story. I think it's a one in a million. I mean, who gets a role of a lifetime that's just going to college and bodybuilding, right? Never yeah. acted in his life. Gets a role, one in a million role in a movie that is continued to inspire and, and continue to have an impact in the wrestling community. It's like, it's amazing. I just, I'm just so blessed with that. I just have to say, incredible. Yeah, I think you have a great story. You know, you should definitely consider it. Uh, have you written any books? No, I've actually got a whole um, file system here of a, of a book that I was going to write, um, and it was it was t- it was called the Tan Program of Tennis Acupuncture and Nutrition. So I've been thinking about this for like for years about the nutritional aspect. And wanting tennis players to be more on that, but I think I think that Novak Djokovic has got people more inspired. Uh, he's a little bit bigger fish in that pond. But uh, no, I haven't. I actually am intending to write and to, to write more. I actually sat down and wrote a treatment with my wife with the BQ series, and then um, I did backgrounds on every one of the actors you know, over the say this is what's happened over the last 30 years so i got my chance at writing and then the producer actually wrote the pilot and we helped him edit it and kind of get it out there so i i am kind of dabbling more into the writing um uh, for the you know for over a year i did a seminar a podcast once a week on nutrition and i would have to research i would write it and then i'd memorize and then we would shoot it live and we couldn't edit it it was just a live shot so I did that for a year, and so now it's uh, about putting some of those things maybe into a hard copy. That would be a good idea. Thanks. Yeah, it definitely would be. Well, Frank, I want to thank you so much for coming on today and uh, sharing all this great uh, knowledge, and I hope you 
enjoy the rest of your summer. I'll be on the lookout for the Vision Quest series in the future. Absolutely, man. And thanks for having me on. Really appreciate it. And stay in touch, brother. My pleasure. Absolutely. Have a great day. All right, man. Take care. Okay. Bye-bye. Well, there you have it. Frank Jasper. Ain't he a cool dude? Nice guy. A wealth of knowledge. A health scholar. I enjoy talking to him. Well, until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying, there's no shame in living in the past because the present sucks. Later, dudes.